to another in the San Diego Air and Space Museum speaker series. My name is Mike Bennick. I uh, am retired from NASA. I worked there for 30 years. Most of my time was in the launch vehicle area, uh, which I'll be speaking about today. And uh, as you'll hear in this presentation, my career arc paralleled a very interesting time in the history of launch vehicles. And uh, now I volunteer some of my time as a docent at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. So as I said, I'll be talking about launch vehicles and how spacecraft hit their target. Before I go into that, I'd like to share with you some of the spacecraft that we have on display at the museum. First is the Explorer 1 spacecraft. Explorer 1 was the very first satellite launched by the United States in 1958. It was followed closely by the Vanguard 1 satellite, also in 1958. And uh, we have a model of uh, the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft. Those spacecraft were launched in 1972 and 73, and they were the first spacecraft to leave the solar system. We also have a full-scale model of the Curiosity rover, which was launched in 2011. And as you may know, it is now on the surface of Mars, is still active and exploring. We also have the only GPS satellite on display in the world, and it is displayed from the ceiling in our space gallery. Uh, the GPS satellites uh, began launching in 1978, and they are still active, obviously. If you um, use GPS uh, maps, on your iPhone or Android device uh, to get anywhere, then you are using the GPS constellation. So you may ask, where are these spacecraft now? Well, Explorer 1 re-entered the Earth's atmosphere in 1970. Due to atmospheric drag, eventually things will fall back to Earth and uh, burn up in the atmosphere, and that was the fate of Explorer 1. Vanguard 1, on the other hand, is actually still in Earth orbit, and it is the oldest satellite still orbiting the Earth. Pioneers 10 and 11, as I mentioned earlier, are now in interstellar space, which means that they have left our solar system and are now traveling between the stars. Pioneer 10 uh, left the solar system in 1983, and Pioneer 11 in 1990. Curiosity rover still on the surface of Mars in active exploration. And the GPS is actually a constellation of satellites in six different orbits. There are 31 operational satellites in six different orbital planes. And so actually, regardless of where you are on Earth, you should always be within view of four GPS satellites. And they will give you a very accurate location for you on the surface of the Earth. So as I said before, uh, I worked in launch vehicles at NASA for most of my career. And I'd like to talk about the uh, display that we have in the space gallery as you enter. You will see a number of uh, early Atlas launch vehicle models there. The first one in this display case is an Atlas ICBM. The ICBM stands for Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. And uh, you can see here, this is the Atlas vehicle. And up at the top would have been the nuclear warhead that would be delivered to an adversary. So these Atlas vehicles actually were built here in San Diego, Kearney Mesa. The facility no longer exists, but I'll have a little bit to say about that later in this presentation. The second vehicle you see in the display case here is Mercury Atlas. And this was the vehicle that was used to put John Glenn into orbit. A little difficult to see here, but this is the Mercury capsule, and the red at the very top is the uh, escape tower that would have pulled the Mercury capsule away from the Atlas booster if that there was some kind of uh, an emergency during the launch. Uh, so that, that's the vehicle that launched John Glenn into orbit in February 1962. Then we have a couple other Atlas vehicles in here that have the Agena upper stage. Upper stages were used uh, to put satellites into a higher orbit or even in some cases an Earth escape orbit. And these uh, two models here show 
some early upper stages called the Aegina. The one on the right here actually looks like it was the Aegina target vehicle for Gemini. Gemini used on several missions Aegina vehicles to practice rendezvous and targeting. Rendezvous simply trying to find another vehicle in space and then uh, docking once you find that vehicle, then attaching yourself to it. So these were two very important uh, aspects and skills that the astronauts needed to learn before they could do the Apollo missions. So Atlas uh, performed a very important job in launching that uh, target vehicle for the Gemini astronauts to practice with. Then we have the Atlas Centaur, and you can see here now a much wider, the same diameter as the Atlas vehicle upper stage in contrast to the Gina. So the Centaur was a much more capable upper stage and it was used for uh, heavier payloads or payloads that required more energy to get into a uh, Earth escape trajectory. And again, I'll have a little bit more to talk about that in a moment. So moving on to another display case uh, in the space gallery, uh, you'll see here more uh, rockets or launch vehicles as we call them. In the back here is a Titan II this uh, looks like it might be the Titan II in the ICBM configuration. So Atlas was not the only intercontinental ballistic missile. We did have Titan IIs. And in the foreground here, you see a couple of Delta vehicles, a Delta II and a Delta III. The Delta vehicle was a real workhorse for NASA. Uh, it launched many, many medium-class uh, payloads. And uh, even though these aren't the same scale, you can get an idea of the size of the payload fairing within which the spacecraft is protected during its ascent through the atmosphere compared to, for example, an Atlas payload fairing, much larger, and even the Titan in the background here. So here we have an Atlas uh, 2AS. It's a much more modern, although no longer used, uh, Atlas vehicle, Atlas Centaur. The main difference here is uh, the addition of some solid rocket boosters onto the Atlas. And again, I'll have more to say about it, that in a moment. And finally, we have the Titan IV in the back. The Titan uh, IV uh, grew out of the Titan II. There were some intermediate vehicles called Titan III, which we don't have on display. But the Titan II basic vehicle is the core vehicle that you see here in silver. And then to add much more thrust to boost heavier payloads, solid rocket motors, much like the space shuttle, were added to the core Titan II vehicle, and then a large payload fairing to accommodate very large spacecraft was added and the upper stage, and there were a variety of them, would also have been encased in the payload fairing. And lastly, uh, on that same display case is a model of the Atlas V. The Atlas V uh, really doesn't share much heritage with the prior Atlas vehicles, it's a much different vehicle, and um, without belaboring it here, I'll talk about that a little bit later when I look at the uh, Atlas evolution. But this vehicle, uh, notably, is the one that launched the Mars rovers, Curiosity and Perseverance, the two most recent rovers that are on Mars. Okay, so uh, let's talk about now how we go about actually getting a spacecraft to its target. What are the major steps to do that? And this is, of course, a very simplified, uh, but it gives you the general idea and the general steps on how we do that. First is the project definition, basically answering the question, where do we want to go? So let's say, for example, we want to send an orbiter to Jupiter. Okay, that's fine. Now, the initial design phase would say, well, how big do we think it's going to be? Is this several tons? Is it a few hundred pounds? What kind of instruments will it be carrying? How many uh, different scientific instruments will be on there? And once we know that, then we can basically, uh, once the spacecraft organization knows that, then they can basically target a launch class vehicle. So a small vehicle for a small payload and then so forth, medium and large. Then the requirements development phase begins. So basically at this point, the uh, spacecraft organization needs to come up with everything that they need from the launch vehicle organization once that vehicle is selected. And so we call this interface requirements. And in fact, a document called the interface requirements document is developed. In that document, the spacecraft organization would 
put down everything that they are requiring from the launch vehicle. And uh, from my particular point of view as a trajectory analyst, when I first started out, the key thing that we needed was the state vector. The state vector simply says, this is where we want to be in space at a particular time. So that's our target. And, and that is the basic handoff position between the launch vehicle and the spacecraft. Okay, moving along in this phase, we are now at the analysis and integration phase. This is where we do the mission design, which is the area that I worked in uh, early in my career, basically figuring out how do we get from Earth to that state vector position where the spacecraft would like to be left when it separates from the launch vehicle. But there are many other disciplines that are involved at this time. There's a software that has to be developed to tell the launch vehicle how to fly and get to that state vector. There's something we call coupled loads analysis, coupled meaning the spacecraft is attached to the launch vehicle, and it's going to see an environment during the launch from Earth to the state vector that is somewhat violent. There's a lot of shaking going on. There's a, a strong acoustic environment from the rocket engines, as well as the atmosphere as it flies through. Uh, it's vibrating. It's seeing a lot of different things. So there are different programs that can analyze this, that makes a model of the spacecraft, makes a model of the launch vehicle. And then the uh, launch vehicle organization with these results goes back to the spacecraft organization and says, here's the environment you're going to see. And oh, by the way, uh, the way you have your spacecraft designed, uh, this instrument is going to fall off or the acoustic environment is going to be exceeded for this instrument, the way you have it defined in your interface requirements. So the spacecraft organization then would go back, perhaps redesign a bracket uh, or redesign a, uh, an instrument or locate it in a different place on the spacecraft uh, in order to accommodate the environment. And in some cases, they may go back and say, well, can you put some insulation in the payload fairing to reduce the acoustic environment here? So it's an iterative process between the launch vehicle and the spacecraft organizations to be able to accommodate the spacecraft on the launch vehicle. So once we have the analysis phase fairly complete, uh, the spacecraft now can enter into the fabrication and test phase as well as the launch vehicle. So they're, they're both proceeding more or less parallel now. The spacecraft is being built either at a contractor facility like Lockheed Martin, or it may be built in-house as is often done at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory with their uh, rovers. After the uh, spacecraft and the launch vehicle are built then uh, and tested, then they are shipped to the launch site uh, where they are checked out and prepared for launch. And this is the first time now that the spacecraft and launch vehicle actually see each other. They've been built and tested in separate locations, but now at the launch site, it's time for them to come together and uh, be placed on the uh, launch pad, and uh, if everything goes well, we will have a successful launch. Okay, so let's now take a look at some uh, astrodynamic basics. Way back in the uh, 1700s, Isaac Newton uh, came up with this thought experiment. It's called Isaac Newton's Cannon. And what he said was, hey, let's, let's take a cannon, bring it up to a very high mountain, and mount the uh, cannon parallel to the surface of the Earth. And if we uh, shoot a projectile out, we know it will travel for a little ways and fall back to Earth, let's say here at point A. But if we give it a little bit more energy, a little bit more powder, it will go a little bit farther before it falls back to Earth, say at point B. And even more again, it will travel quite a ways around the Earth until it falls at point C. These are all called ballistic trajectories, and uh, these are the kinds of trajectories that the Atlas ICBM, for example, would, would fly when it was delivering a uh, warhead. Carrying that step a little bit further, he said, you know, if we put enough energy into this cannon, the projectile will actually be traveling so fast that as it is trying to fall to the Earth, its motion around the Earth will keep it from contacting the Earth. So that would be trajectory D, where we actually tra travel all the way around the Earth without contacting the Earth. But we are falling all the time. So this is called free fall. 
where we're falling towards the earth, but our velocity is great enough to keep us above the earth. And ultimately, if we were to add enough energy, we could actually escape the gravitational pull of the earth and we would be on trajectory E. So A, B, and C are what we call suborbital or ballistic trajectories. D would be called uh, an orbital trajectory. We uh, achieved orbital velocity, which will keep us uh, from entering the uh, Earth's atmosphere and we'll just continue to rotate around the Earth. And E is when we exceed the orbital velocity and we actually achieve Earth escape. So now on Earth, we generally think of the shortest distance between two points as a straight line, sometimes called Euclidean geometry. And this is valid for small distances on the Earth. So we all are familiar with the concept of if we want to go to point A to point B, we travel in a straight line. Well, actually, when you are in space, objects don't travel in straight lines when they're under the gravitational influence of a central body. The central body is just a fancy way of saying the Earth, the Sun, or the Moon. Some central body that has a gravitational influence on a projectile. So let's say we have the Earth here. We can have circular orbits. If you remember Isaac Newton's uh, thought experiment, we get a projectile enough velocity, we can be in a circular orbit about the Earth. We can even have elliptical orbits where the Earth is at one of the focus uh, points of this ellipse. But let's say the central body is the sun. And here we have the Earth, and we want to go to Mars. And of course, none of this is to scale. This is all exaggerated just to show the point. So remember the previous slide where I showed enough energy was added to the projectile to actually escape the Earth's gravity. Well, when it does that, it is now traveling under the influence of the sun as its central body. So you can see here is again another orbit going from Earth to Mars. It's elliptical because we're closer to the sun at Earth than we are at Mars. And we are now traveling in what's called an interplanetary orbit or heliocentric orbit. Heliocentric meaning the sun-centered orbit. Okay, continuing a bit with just a couple more nomenclature items. Uh, you'll often hear the terms apogee and perigee. And this simply means the highest point in an orbit about the Earth and the lowest point in an orbit about the Earth. So again, here we have the Earth. And if we're in a circular orbit, there is no high and low point. No matter where we are in a perfectly circular orbit, the distance is always the same. So apogee equals perigee. If we're in an elliptical orbit, it's obvious to see here that there is a low point and there is a high point in that orbit about the Earth. And you can see here, this would be the perigee and this would be the apogee, the high point. Okay, let's get back now for a second to the launch vehicle that I'm probably most familiar with, at least spent most of my career with when I was working in launch vehicles, and that's the Atlas vehicle. As I said before, we have the Atlas ICBM was the start of this family. And if you go to Gillespie Field, which is part of the uh, Air and Space Museum, uh, located not too far from the museum, you can actually see an Atlas ICBM a vehicle there mounted vertically, and it's a pretty impressive sight. This vehicle was powered by LOX, which is liquid oxygen, and RP1, which is a highly refined uh, kerosene. RP standing uh, obviously for rocket propellant. And the vehicle was built here in Kearney Mesa starting in the 1950s. And, uh, I alluded to this earlier when I talked about the upper stages in the display case, but once the scientists wanted to get things into orbit or out of Earth orbit, we needed some kind of upper stage to provide that additional energy that the uh, Atlas was unable to do. So starting at that time, we had added upper stages to the Atlas vehicle. In this case here, you see this slim, slender rocket that was mounted on the nose of the Atlas that was called the Able. It was used from about 1959 to 60, just a brief period of time, uh, because the scientists always want to put more instruments on their spacecraft or go to a place that requires more energy. So we developed the Agena upper stage, here we have the Agena A, 
And uh, you can see it also had a brief service life just in 1960. And it only had a what we call single start rocket engine. So uh, once that engine was ignited and burned on the Agena and shut off, it could not be restarted. So that was a limitation. And what was developed after that was the Agena B. And uh, it had a restartable engine. And uh, that was very important uh, because you'll see a little bit later when we talk again some more about trajectory analysis, why it's important to have a vehicle that can be restarted. And this had a service life of about six or seven years in the uh, 1960s. Again, the stage is mounted at the front end of the Atlas. And then finally, the Agena D, that was the target vehicle that I mentioned uh, for the Gemini missions. And the Agena D actually had a, a fairly long service life, about 15 years. And just like the other slides there, uh, it is mounted at the front end of the Atlas. So that's the beginning of the Atlas family tree, all derived from the Atlas ICBM. Again, uh, starting with the ICBM and evolving even further, we have now the Atlas Centaur. Uh, the Atlas Centaur has a very high energy upper stage mounted on top of the Atlas, same diameter as the Atlas vehicle, 10 feet. And it had a payload fairing made out of fiberglass honeycomb type structure. And the Atlas, uh, the Centaur upper stage was a very high upper energy upper stage. It was propelled by the combustion of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. The liquid hydrogen is about minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit, and liquid oxygen is about minus 290 uh, some degrees Fahrenheit. So in order to keep these propellants in liquid form, there were insulation panels mounted uh, on the circumference of the Centaur upper stage uh, in order to keep those propellants liquid state. And it had a very long life, uh, 1962 to 1989, and uh, launched a variety of payloads that I'll talk about a little bit later. Again, you can see the payload fairing here, kind of small, conical. Payloads continued to grow, and there was the need for larger payload fairings to accommodate the volume of the larger payloads. So the Atlas I was developed and had a large metal fairing. And that has service life uh, from 1991 to 1997. You can see there the, uh, the payload fairing. The Atlas II and IIA now incorporated a couple of different things. One was the insulation panels were no longer used. The insulation was provided by some foam insulation, very similar to the foam insulation that is found on the space shuttle external tank. And you can see it shares that kind of orange color there. The booster was lengthened. So the, the Atlas booster lengthened to be able to carry additional propellants and uh, burn longer and, and deliver the Centaur to a higher altitude before it had to start. And the Centaur vehicle up until this time had two RL-10 rocket engines that used that liquid hydrogen and oxygen. But on this vehicle, they incorporated the ability to extend that nozzle and the benefit of that is that now those products of combustion, the gases from combining the hydrogen and oxygen, uh, now had more area on the rocket engine to push against and provide higher thrust. And this vehicle was in service from 91 to uh, 2002. And then uh, in the long string of Atlas II vehicles, ultimately we have now the Atlas II AS. And the main uh, difference here between the 2 and 2A is that the 2AS incorporated four strap-on solid rocket motor boosters, increasing the thrust at liftoff even more to, to supplement the thrust of the booster stage. Now, an interesting thing that I haven't mentioned uh, yet, uh, by the way, this was in service from 1993 to 2004, is that the booster of the Atlas, in all cases, consisted of three Rocketdyne main engines, but you don't want to carry a lot of weight along if you don't need it. So after the Atlas reached a certain uh, altitude, those two outer of the three booster engines were jettisoned, and only the single center engine would continue to burn. And so the Atlas became known as a stage and a half vehicle because of that. <laughs> 
Another interesting uh, feature of the Atlas and Centaur is that they were known as balloon tanks. The skin of the Atlas and the Centaur was very, very thin, stainless steel. In many cases, the thickness was no more than that of a dime. And uh, in order for the vehicle to be transported or erected on the launch uh, stand, it had to either be pressurized or be stretched. Otherwise, it would just collapse under its own weight. Hence, the uh, tanks were known as balloon tanks. These vehicles are all descendants of the Atlas ICBM and the incorporation of the high energy Centaur liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen as the upper stage. Okay, so from the Atlas II, then we get the Atlas III, the Atlas IIA and IIB. And what we have here now is again a longer Atlas able to carry more propellant, a longer Centaur, likewise able to carry more propellant, and also could accommodate one or two RL-10 engines on the Centaur. Then we really have a completely new vehicle now in the Atlas V. This is the current vehicle that is being flown uh, by General, uh, sorry, by Lockheed Martin. It's no longer General Dynamics. It was a, a basically completely new design in the booster. The booster is structurally stable, no longer a balloon tank. The diameter was increased to 12 and a half feet. There are new payload fairing options, as you can see, much different than the Atlas III, and able to carry much larger payloads and also able to accommodate much larger strap-on boosters in configurations of one to five of these uh, strap-on boosters. The Atlas III had a relatively short service life from 2000 to 2005, and the Atlas V started in 2002 and is still the workhorse in the Atlas family. So again, payload fairing, booster, and strap-ons. One other very interesting change from Atlas II series was the elimination of the Rocketdyne engines and the replacement with the Russian RD-180 engines. So I often found this interesting that the Russians uh, were selling us uh, rocket engines and the military was using those rocket engines on Atlas vehicles to send spy satellites to spy on Russia. But nevertheless, that's the commerce and we use those engines successfully on the Atlas III and the Atlas V vehicle. So Atlas III and Atlas V no longer a stage and a half booster, but nevertheless uh, has some heritage in the Atlas II vehicle. So some notable spacecraft that NASA launched using Atlas, first of all, were some very important spacecraft that uh, preceded and were necessary for successful landing of the Apollo missions on the moon. Uh, first was the Ranger. The Rangers uh, basically were, hey, can we just even get to the moon and hit it? And these spacecraft impacted the moon, but took uh, photography, took pictures as they were headed into a crash landing. Uh, the lunar orbiters came after them, and they obviously by the name went into orbit around the moon and did some uh, high resolution mapping of uh, potential landing sites for Apollo. And then the uh, lunar surveyor missions that actually soft landed on the moon. It's hard to imagine, but going back to the late 50s, early 60s, we didn't even know what the moon was made of. And there was some speculation that it might be very fine powder and anything that we tried to land on the moon would just sink into it and be lost. So the lunar uh, surveyors actually proved that we could soft land on the moon and uh, stay on the surface. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is Apollo 12 astronaut Pete Conrad, and he is recovering some instruments from one of the uh, lunar surveyors that's on the surface. And in the far background there, you can just make out the uh, lunar module sitting on the surface. Pioneer Venus was another one that was launched by an Atlas vehicle, Atlas Centaur, and it delivered an orbiter and probes to Venus. One uh, the mothership here stayed in orbit around Venus and a number of probes were dropped into the atmosphere and landed on the surface. As we talked about before with the models for Pioneer 10 and 11, they were launched on Atlas Centaur and were the uh, first spacecraft to fly by Jupiter and Saturn. 
the Atlas V vehicle that I just finished talking about launched the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers, which are both continuing to function on the surface of Mars. And lowly Pluto, which is sometimes a planet, sometimes not a planet, uh, was flown by the New Horizons spacecraft, the first spacecraft to ever fly by Pluto and uh, take high-resolution pictures of it and its moon, uh, Sharon. So you can see that the launch vehicles really uh, had quite a heyday delivering a number of robotic spacecraft around the solar system. This is just a small sample, but we have to put ourselves back near the end of the Apollo era uh, when President Nixon approved the development of the space shuttle. Uh, the space shuttle promised to have routine access to space, reduce costs. It was gonna launch twice a month. It was going to do everything for everybody and so, therefore, the logical conclusion was we don't need launch vehicles any longer. So there was a lot of concern in, in the community about launch vehicles becoming uh, extinct. And uh, would the space shuttle really live up to its promise? So uh, in 1982, the national space policy changed and uh, essentially said, look, folks, we're going to launch everything on the shuttle but we'll only fly launch vehicles until it's ready. And by the way, there may be some unique national security reasons why uh, we might develop some special purpose launch capabilities. So that was kind of a vague statement. And it was right around this time that I started working for NASA in 1982 when this policy was changing. Uh, not too long after that, in 1984, the Commercial Space Launch Act started to encourage the private sector to provide their own launch services. So the government was starting to move in a direction of, uh, we don't want to procure hardware any longer, uh, launch vehicle industry, you're mature enough now where we think that you can uh, do that on your own and provide uh, the service of launching something. But remember Isaac Newton, we can't violate the laws of physics. Remember his canon experiment, his canon thought experiment? Here's a key issue. The space shuttle can only get to low Earth orbit. The space shuttle never flew higher than about 380 miles when it delivered the Hubble Space Telescope. So, Houston, we have a problem. How do we get spacecraft to higher Earth orbits and onto interplanetary trajectories if the space shuttle can only fly to a maximum of maybe 380 miles. Well, this was the advent of the shuttle upper stages. There were a variety of them uh, that were being developed because this problem was recognized that, hey, the shuttle can only go so high, and if we want to go higher to deliver weather satellites, spy satellites, scientific satellites in Earth orbit or escape orbit, we're going to need something else of higher energy to do that for us. So before I go into the specific uh, program that I was working on at this time, uh, I need to give you some trajectory analysis basics. So again, remember we're in Earth orbit and this might be a shuttle orbit. Of course, nothing here is to scale again. It's all exaggerated just to make the point. But the shuttle would be in orbit around the Earth, and it's got a minimum velocity to stay in orbit of about 17,500 miles per hour. Now imagine if we add some velocity here in this orbit. We call it a velocity change or a delta V. What's going to happen after that is we'll be in this orbit. The upper stage orbit and whatever payload is attached to it will be in an elliptical orbit about the Earth. But let's say we don't want this perigee, we want to be in a higher circular orbit. What we would do at apogee is add some more velocity or delta V number two that will raise this perigee and the resulting orbit will look like this. It can be circular, it can be elliptical, but in any event, it is a higher orbit than where we started out at with this space shuttle. Now let's say, again, we're in this shuttle orbit going about 17,500 miles an hour, and we want to get onto an Earth escape trajectory. Well, in this case, we would add simply one very large delta V velocity change, and the resulting orbit would be an escape trajectory 
we would be having, be going at least 25,000 miles per hour to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. And depending upon where we wanted to go, what planet, we would have different Earth escape velocities for that if we wanted to go directly. So the Centaur family tree, I want to talk about two specific vehicles here. The reason being, you see the word shuttle here and shuttle here. All the other vehicles have Atlas or Titan above them. So what we were doing is saying, okay, these upper stages flew on other launch vehicles, but now we have to fly on the space shuttle. How are we going to accommodate and make use of the shuttle cargo bay, which is 60 feet long and 15 feet in diameter? All these other vehicles were 10 feet in diameter and rather lengthy. So what we decided to do was to squeeze down the hydrogen tank on these other centaurs and make use of the 15 foot diameter of the shell cargo bay. So you can see the wider tank here, that's the hydrogen tank. The oxygen tank maintained its 10 foot diameter. And there were two configurations of the um, shuttle centaur upper stage that we were integrating into the shuttle. Here is a uh, cutaway view of the space shuttle. This was the shuttle centaur program. Here's our mission uh, logo up in the upper left. And what I want to point out here is the size of the centaur as it is in the shuttle cargo bay with the Galileo spacecraft mounted at the forward end. You can see that the Centaur took up about half of the cargo bay. It was a very large vehicle. The reason being is that uh, the Galileo spacecraft was going to go to Jupiter on a direct trajectory, and it needed a very large push from this Centaur high-energy upper stage. It was supported by a structure in the aft end of the cargo bay uh, that provided the services it needed and also gave it a little kick after it rotated 45 degrees to push the Centaur out of the cargo bay with the payload attached at the front end. And uh, in a succeeding slide here, I'll show you a little bit better what that looked like. But there were, as I said, two different versions being developed, one for the Air Force, much squattier as you can see here, and one for NASA. The reason being uh, that we had a squatty one for the Air Force is they had much larger payloads than NASA, so you can imagine it took up less room, and they weren't going on escape trajectories, so they didn't need quite as much energy in their upper stage because they were staying in Earth orbit. So here were the first two spacecraft that were intended to fly for NASA on the shuttle Centaur. On the left here, you see Ulysses. Ulysses was formerly known as the International Solar Polar Mission, and the idea was that the uh, Centaur would deliver Ulysses on a trajectory to Jupiter. And you may ask why, if it was a solar mission, was it flying to Jupiter? Well, most of the planets are in a plane uh, called the ecliptic. So you can envision the sun with all the planets orbiting around it. And uh, they're all pretty much in the same plane, like a plate. If we want to fly over the pole of the sun, what we needed to do was get out of that horizontal plane and turn it 90 degrees. So Ulysses was going to use the massive gravitational pull of Jupiter to turn that plane from horizontal to vertical, essentially, to enable it to fly over the poles of the sun. Galileo, on the other hand, which you see here in the configuration just before separating from the space shuttle, that's that 45 degree angle that I was talking about, it, on the other hand, was going to also fly to Jupiter, but once it arrived at Jupiter, it would go into orbit around Jupiter, and it also carried a probe that it would drop into the atmosphere of Jupiter to um, explore it. Here you see the, uh, the full-size Centaur G prime. This was, uh, is on display in front of the Glenn Research Center entrance, and a number of people here that work on that program in front of it and it gives you a good idea of the scale of that vehicle. Okay, so um, everything is proceeding towards launch. I was working uh, as a trajectory analyst on Ulysses at this time in my career and uh, had been doing that for about four years. When uh, we were getting ready now to launch uh, Ulysses and Galileo in May of 1986, that was the planetary window for us. 
And as I had mentioned on the previous slide describing the pictures, Ulysses was going to fly the first solar polar mission and Galileo was going to be the first spacecraft to orbit Jupiter. The Centaur G prime was down at the uh, Cape at uh, Kennedy Space Center, uh, undergoing its final testing at the launch site. We were practicing loading the hydrogen and uh, oxygen into the uh, vehicle and making sure we had all of those procedures accurate. And uh, we were about to do the final integration of the shuttle, the Centaur and Ulysses and Galileo, and the uh, launch was going to occur uh, later that spring in May of 1986. But in January of 1986, this happened. We had the Challenger accident. We lost uh, seven astronauts and uh, everything changed. Everything at NASA was, was looked at again. And uh, we really had to recoup and decide where, where were we really going? So this is what I call the, uh, the true dawn of the uh, commercial era. NASA and a received a new presidential directive on uh, the national space policy in 1988 after a lot of uh, soul searching on the future of uh, the agency. And uh, as far as launching things goes, uh, obviously uh, government said, you know, maybe it's not a good idea to put all of our eggs in the shuttle basket. So maybe we ought to have a mix of vehicles uh, to do our space transportation the shuttle and expendable launch vehicles. And this was what we referred to as the mixed fleet concept. So don't eliminate launch vehicles. They do have uh, a place in our uh, stable of vehicles to get to space. But big difference is we won't maintain an ELV adjunct to the shuttle, meaning we no longer would buy the hardware before this time, every time we had an Atlas vehicle that was built for a mission, NASA actually would accept and own the hardware. So we would no longer do that. Instead, we would encourage that the commercial launch industry contract for necessary ELV launch services. So this included NASA. And uh, the idea was basically that uh, we would no longer buy the hardware what we would do is buy a ride on that hardware. So just like you don't own the bus or you don't own the uh, aircraft, you just pay for a ticket. And uh, the company that owns that bus or that aircraft will deliver you to your destination. And finally, commercial and foreign payloads that NASA actually used to launch for other governments or for commercial entities would no longer be done by the government. Those organizations, if they wanted a ride on a launch vehicle, they would go directly to the contractor to buy that service. So there was an interesting time now, starting in the early 90s, where a, not, a number of the uh, aerospace companies were uh, buying up one another. And Martin Marietta acquired General Dynamics Space Systems Division in the early 1990s. And for, for many, many years, the uh, organization in Cleveland, uh, uh, Lewis Research Center, subsequently named Glenn Research Center, had managed the Atlas Centaur and maintained a resident office here in San Diego at the Kearney Mesa facility where the vehicles were built and where the engineering uh, staff was housed. But when Martin Marietta acquired General Dynamics, uh, they said, hey, we're going to move all of that manufacturing and engineering capability to Denver. So we needed to establish a new resident office in the Denver facility uh, starting in about 1994. And I put my name in at that point. I had been um, a trajectory analyst and supervisor of a small group of analysts uh, for about 12 years in Cleveland. And I felt it was time for a little bit of a career change and thought this might be an interesting opportunity uh, to go to Denver and actually work in the contractor facility and see how the hardware is uh, built and uh, maintained and then shipped to the launch site. I didn't think I would get that job. Uh, and to this day, I'm surprised that I was selected because I was an analyst and really had no hardware background at all. But I did go there and uh, start up that office in the uh, mid-90s, 1994, actually. And during my time there, I was there from 94 to 98. Three high-priority vehicles were built in 94 to 97. 
And those were the last Atlas I, AC or Atlas Centaur 79. That vehicle was built for a GOES weather satellite. GOES stands for Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite. And uh, whenever you're watching your local news and the weather comes on and you see these pictures, space, uh, the clouds and wind patterns and what have you, that's coming from one of these GOES weather satellites that we uh, launched. And there's uh, been a constellation of them up there for a number of years. Uh, the second very important uh, vehicle was AC-141, Atlas-141. And uh, this was slated to be the very first Atlas 2AS vehicle to launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base. All of our Atlas Centaurs had launched from uh, the Kennedy Space Center on the East Coast up until this time. And this was for the new flagship Earth observing satellite called Terra, and it was going to launch into a polar orbit. And without going into the details, basically, uh, when we want to launch something into a polar orbit, we launch from the West Coast because we can launch pretty much directly south and avoid flying over any land mass. And if we want to launch spacecraft into more uh, equatorial type orbits or low inclination orbits, we launch easterly from uh, the Kennedy Space Center. So that's why we have an East Coast and a West Coast launch sites. The last uh, high priority vehicle that uh, I was privileged to be a part of when it was built uh, in Denver is the Titan IV Centaur 21, which was the first Titan IV Centaur with solid rocket motor upgrades on it. And I'll mention that here in a photo in a moment. This was the launch vehicle that was built for the Cassini spacecraft, the first spacecraft that would go into orbit about Saturn. So. I mentioned uh, the phase of fabrication and checkout. Uh, one of the main steps in that is something we called a product review. A product review was when the vehicle had completed its fabrication and it's still at the uh, fabrication facility. In this case, the Martin Marietta facility in Denver. You can see here the 79 on the tail of the Atlas vehicle here. This is the vehicle in the plant. And product review is a multi-day effort where a number of engineers, specialist engineers, will come out to the plant and look at all of the build paperwork, everything that was done on that vehicle during its fabrication, and make sure that everything looks proper before the vehicle is shipped to the launch site. So it doesn't matter. There, there would be people that were propulsion experts, structures experts, avionics experts, and so forth. Anything they had to do with the build of this vehicle, those government engineers, NASA engineers, and contractor engineers for NASA would come and spend about a week going over all the details, the paperwork, and then even uh, when necessary, go into the factory and do a physical examination of the vehicle. Again, this will give you an idea of the scale of an Atlas vehicle. Uh, here are the three boosters that I've mentioned before. And this white section is that booster package that would jettison the two outboard engines uh, not too long into flight. The center engine would continue to burn until the Atlas propellants were depleted. And there I am in the background here as the Denver resident office chief with the folks that we hosted in this product review for uh, AC-79, Atlas Center 79, the last Atlas one. Here are a couple of photos of those vehicles uh, on their launch day. AC-79 launched from the East Coast, the last Atlas One in April 1997. And uh, AC-141, the first launch of an Atlas Centaur from Vandenberg Air Force Base in December of 1999. And just to remind you, that is the model that is in the display case here at the museum. And the third vehicle that I talked about, the Titan Centaur 21, uh, launching the Cassini mission, which was a night launch in October, 1997. And it was the first launch of this configuration that incorporated the solid rocket motor upgrade. These are the two solid rocket motors and an 86 foot long payload fairing, first time uh, for that with this configuration and the Centaur and Cassini uh, nestled inside that payload fairing. Again, just a reminder, this is also a model of that vehicle in the, uh, in the display case at the museum. Well, in the 1990s, it wasn't just the uh, contractors that were consolidating. 
NASA also took a look at itself and under Administrator Dan Golden. Uh, his mantra was faster, better, cheaper. And he said, you know, let's take a look at how we're doing business in NASA. And the agency conducted what was referred to as a zero base review. Basically, ground up, look at how we do business. And one of the conclusions of that review was, hey, you know, we manage uh, launch vehicles from a couple of different centers, uh, particularly uh, Lewis or Glenn Research Center in Cleveland and Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And yet we launched these vehicles from Kennedy Space Center. So why don't we just uh, consolidate everything at Kennedy Space Center? So that was a conclusion, and that was our mandate to uh, consolidate at Kennedy Space Center and create the Launch Services Program. But the challenge was that we had capabilities that existed at several NASA centers for nearly 40 years, and somehow we had to move that capability uh, to Kennedy Space Center because Kennedy Space Center's specialty was receiving the launch vehicle erecting it on the launch pad, checking it out, and uh, conducting the launch operation. So the transition efforts began in earnest in 1997 while I was still in Denver. And uh, through some convoluted process that I won't go into, uh, I was selected to go to Kennedy Space Center and start up an engineering division uh, that incorporated all of the specialties that were resident at uh, Lewis uh, Research Center in Cleveland and Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and get that capability established at Kennedy Space Center. So I became a part of that new program uh, and moved there in 1998. And uh, eventually I became the uh, director of Expendable Launch Vehicle Launch Services. And uh, we were recognized a few years later by the uh, stellar Award for Space Achievement in 2002 presented by the uh, Rotary National Committee. I was privileged enough to uh, go to Johnson Space Center to receive that award, and uh, it was given to us for the successful consolidation of the ELV program at Kennedy Space Center. And all the while we were doing that and moving this capability from the other centers to Kennedy, we continued to launch successfully and manage that transition. So we were uh, recognized by this high award in 2002. And it, this is just an article that was in our Kennedy uh, in-house newspaper showing me holding the award uh, back in my office uh, and a couple of models there, of course, of launch vehicles that we were managing at the time. Okay, so getting back to the whole process, you remember the steps. We're now at about step number seven. We are at the launch site preparing the spacecraft and the launch vehicle uh, for launch. So the spacecraft typically arrives in a big cargo plane. In this case here, you can see it's boxed up and being moved off of a C-5 transport aircraft. It's moved over then to a spacecraft processing facility where it's unboxed and it's in a clean room. And the uh, spacecraft uh, people now are getting it prepared uh, and ready to be inserted or encapsulated in a payload fairing. And the payload fairing, as I mentioned before, protects it on its trip through the atmosphere into space. And usually they're clamshells, two halves, and here is a spacecraft being uh, is ready to, to be encapsulated by those two halves of the fairing. Here's what it would look like afterwards, and now it's already out at the uh, launch pad and ready to be hoisted up on top of the launch vehicle. So while the spacecraft is doing all of that at the launch site, the launch vehicle folks, on the other hand, now are accepting the booster and moving it out to the launch pad. Here you see an Atlas V booster with those two Russian RD-180 engines visible here. It comes out horizontally, and then it has to be rotated to the vertical and erected on the launch pad. After the booster is there, the upper stage, in this case a Centaur, comes out horizontally as well on a uh, trailer, and it is rotated to the vertical and hoisted up the launch tower and mated to the booster vehicle, the Atlas booster vehicle. And ultimately, we now have an Atlas booster vehicle, in this case an Atlas V with solid rocket motors, and a Centaur and spacecraft mounted inside the payload fairing at the very top of the launch vehicle. 
So now we have an integrated payload and launch vehicle on the launch pad, and we are ready for launch. And what I'm about to show you now are a, a couple of short videos. Uh, the first is the launch of Terra from Vandenberg Air Force Base in 1999, the first Atlas to launch from the West Coast. Here, before I start the video, you see the Atlas vehicle on the launch pad, has the four solid rocket motors here, Atlas, Centaur, and payload inside the payload fairing. Oftentimes people say, gosh, the, the Atlas is all silver. Why do I see all this white here? Well, the Atlas vehicle is not insulated. And remember, it uses liquid oxygen and kerosene. And so that liquid oxygen at minus 290 some degrees Fahrenheit uh, has the ability to condense uh, the any water vapor or other uh, atmospheric gases on the vehicle. So that's why it looks white. Okay, so let's take a look at this, uh, this launch. You'll see it leave the pad. You'll see some mountains in the background, which clearly indicates it's not the East Coast. Video runs uh, less than a minute or so and shows uh, the rocket boosters as well as the solid rocket boosters firing and uh, ends at just about the point where the first pair of boosters burn out and the second pair of boosters ignite. So let's take a look. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Main engine start and liftoff of the Atlas rocket with Terra, flagship of the Earth Observing System. So at the very end there, you saw the burnout of the first pair of boosters and the ignition of the second pair, or what's sometimes referred to as the airlit solids. And uh, we had launch commentary by George Diller, a uh, longtime public affairs official at Kennedy Space Center. And you may have heard his voice many times on shuttle launches as well. Okay, so now the booster has fired, Centaur has fired. And uh, we have all of the managers here in the control room for Terra, and they're all anxiously awaiting to hear that the spacecraft has successfully separated from the Centaur, which means we have successfully delivered the spacecraft to its state vector. Remember that handoff point where the spacecraft organization says, this is the location in space and the time that we want to be dropped off. I think I'm sitting somewhere in here. That doesn't matter, but just gives you an idea of where I would have been on launch day. And uh, they'll all, you'll, you'll see, and it will be obvious when we get the indication that we have the successful spacecraft separation. And then uh, George Diller conducts uh, an interview with me, and there's just a little excerpt of that uh, at the very end of this video to kind of give you an idea of uh, post-launch activities that occur with uh, the launch team. Separation. Happy team here in this room. It appears that the spacecraft is doing very well. We have with us Mike Fedex, the acting director of expendable vehicles from the Kennedy Space Center. Mike, uh, from your perspective, as the Atlas was was flying to deliver Terra to its target, how did the flight look to you? Uh, George, everything was nominal. We had uh, some uh, trials there right at the very end. Uh, we went for the end of the window. Uh, as you know, uh, we did have some problems with upper level winds because of the front that moved in uh, late in the count. Uh, we were able to recover from that and uh, target for the end of the end of the window. Uh, got off just in time and uh, everything in the plus count was perfect. It was a beautiful flight. So it's a good day when we have a successful launch and a successful spacecraft separation. And that's how spacecraft hit their target. 
Uh, obviously, it's a result of a multi-year effort, could be as long as four, five, six, or more years between that project effort definition uh, phase, the very first phase, and a successful launch. But it's uh, a contractor, government team of engineers and scientists that make that happen. The launch vehicle team's job is done after we successfully place the spacecraft in its target orbit, but the spacecraft mission has just begun. Uh, and that's my uh, presentation here on launch vehicles and how spacecraft hit their target. Thanks for watching, and uh, be sure to visit the San Diego Air and Space Museum, where you can see a number of the launch vehicle models and uh, a number of the spacecraft that were launched by the Atlas Centaur, which has its heritage right here in San Diego.